Thank you so much for joining us. Today we will be talking about misinformation and disinformation, the differences, how to deal with it, um, and answer any questions from attendees. So we will start with some prepared questions and then we will open to the Q&A. If you wanna type any questions in there as we go or the chat box, I will be keeping an eye on that um, just in case anything is pertinent to what we're saying at the moment. So Jeff joins us from ProPublica, uh, Me joins us from First Draft News, and Jane joins us. She's the managing editor of the News and Observer and the Herald Sun in North Carolina. They all have great experience and great knowledge on these subjects, so we will get started. So let's start with what is the difference between misinformation and disinformation, just for those who aren't sure. Uh, Me, would you like to start with that? Sure. Um, so misinformation um, is things that weren't ne necessarily intended to be wrong, but are, and get circulated online. It could even include um, a piece of journalism that, that the journalist just got something wrong. And so it's unintentional uh, information that's incorrect. Um, and then disinformation um, is information that is created specifically to deceive. It's, inten it's intended to harm. We also talk about malinformation, uh, which we saw in the 2016 election, and you see it through all kinds of different ways, but, but that is um, information that is genuine, but is shared with the intention to, to uh, sow harm. So a WikiLeaks, uh, the Sony email doc, uh, um, the Sony email grabs, uh, revenge porn, all of those things, those are real pieces of content, um, but they are being shared in a way to sow um, harm in the public in the public interest. So those are the three things we uh, deal with. We're not sure if we'll see any malinformation. Uh, you know, it's still slightly early in the election cycle so far, um, uh, but that's a possibility. Um, and uh, uh, disinformation is what we're really concerned about. Um, uh, as always, is, is the stuff that's, in, that's intentionally driven to sow division and harm. Great, thank you. Um, so, Jeff, did you want to add something? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, just to add a little, little bit sort of to, to sort of the, you know, misinformation, disinformation um, difference. You know, I think often disinformation, there's also an aspect of, um, you know, uh, deliberate acts uh, to, to sort of make it go viral, right? Like uh, sometimes the content itself is designed to go viral. Um, sometimes it's pushed by like a particular community or, you know, a coordinated campaign uh, like bots uh, on social media. It's, you know, the, the, the like transmission of all this stuff is very much sort of intertwined um, with the nature of social media, right? Um, so, you know, they sort of take advantage of, of sort of the, the, the environment of social media to uh, yeah, propagate uh, this, this bad information. Great, thank you. Jane, was there anything you wanted to add? I, I just wanted to point out um, first drafts, of, um, what do you call it, the information, what is the whole universe of misinformation that you call the um, information disorders? which yes. I love. And there's a, a chart for that that's, uh, that explains all of these things that's, um, that's really helpful. Thanks, Jane. Great, I will add that to our tips and resource sheets. So for those who are listening here with us today, we will have a tip sheet that I will be emailing out and including with the recorded video later of what we talk about today, links to useful resources. So don't feel like you have to Google and type everything down as we're going. We will try to provide you with everything. So why don't we go to our next question. So how should newsrooms and journalists prepare uh, for misinformation and disinformation ahead of the election? I guess I can jump in on, on that one since we are doing that at, at, uh, at this moment. I think first of all, you have to decide that you're going to do it and you're not going to ignore misinformation in your community, which, which is so easy to do because our newsrooms are so stretched and it, it really takes a lot of focus and work to do a good fact check. I'm not gonna, not gonna deny that, but I think to the extent that you can do something, you should try to do it. So. I think the first thing is set the parameters of, of what you're going to do and then and then really stick to it. Um, the national fact checking organizations and you know the TV stations, CNN, um, everyone's doing the national fact checks. I think you can probably, if you're in a local newsroom, you can probably 
ignore those for now and, and really focus on what's happening in your state elections or even in your council elections because national news media isn't going to, to bother with those. Um, or even what's going on in your Facebook pages, depending on how small your community is. Um, we have developed a, a sort of system to decide which facts or which statements we want to, to check. And we try to stick to that, you know, to those parameters so we won't be tempted to try everything or just be overwhelmed by everything. So um, one thing that we look for are statements um, or rumors or whatever that seem to be very widely misunderstood. So, and there's a lot of that. It could be Medicare, it could be, uh, right now it could be some of the coronavirus regulations. So if we have an opportunity to clear things up and we, we realize through social media and questions that we get from the public that people don't understand these things, that's, that's where we wanna jump in. We also look for things that are widely repeated. If we see things, it, it is, you know, it, it's not very scientific, but if we see things repeated over and over again on Twitter and Facebook, um, again, letters to the editor, comments on our stories, then we, those sort of bubble up to the top and we will attack those as well. But I think most importantly, we want to focus on, on the issues that if people misunderstand them and if they have the wrong information, it could cause them to make really bad decisions. It could be actually dangerous to their health, to society, to democracy, whatever. So we really want to focus on, on those. So I think just, just um, setting your parameters to begin with and then sticking to it right through the election. Great, thank you. Uh, Jeff or me, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, I guess uh, uh, to sort of add on to, you know, uh, being, being sort of uh, sticking to uh, sort of your, your paradigm for fact checking is um, often and, and, you know, repeated content online. I think, um, you know, there have been studies done uh, about social media that sort of, you know, misleading content actually travels better online, uh, uh, often because it makes, it's something that makes people respond emotionally. Um, and so, you know, if you see something that's repeated uh, that everyone's talking about uh, and, you know, <laughs> you sort of notice yourself, uh, you know, having an emotional response. And I think that that's sort of the time to be most skeptical because it's, you know, it's likely it's got all sort of the elements to go viral, but not necessarily all the elements to sort of be factual. Um, and then to, to add on that too, uh, you know, if you're working in a local newsroom, there's something quite interesting that's been happening in the last uh, year and a half, two years. Um, the, the Columbia Tau Center did a really interesting um, investigation about this, about these local news websites um, that are being backed uh, by sort of partisan uh, backers. Um, uh, and, you know, they, they've sort of put out this list uh, as well. So they've done this um, study of these websites uh, essentially, you know, they, they, we all know sort of about the, the decline of local news, right, um, uh, recently. Um, there, there are these essentially astroturf uh, local news websites that are popping up, you know, all backed sort of by the same entity. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's something to point out ahead of time, right? You, your news organization could look at that site, um, figure out uh, what its connection to the wider scheme is and report on it and sort of like cuts off that uh, potential source of disinformation before, you know, it's there, we're still, you know, two and a half months away. So but before it starts to sort of uh, properly act, if it does, it, it might not, but um, it's something to keep an eye out on. Um, and I can send uh, the link to Kathleen uh, for her to share after the talk. Great, thank you. Yeah, um, I would just add on to that to do a lot of scenario playing, meaning what do we what do we do? How do we report on it on a, a local candidate who um, embraces the QAnon conspiracy theories? How are we going to play that out? Um, what are we going to do um, if X, Y, or Z happens? Like to really um, sort of write your hellscape plan for around the election so that you can think about ways in which your newsroom may have deficits or may have strengths and how to pull those resources together uh, based on a lot of dis different situations that are probable. I mean, it's not something that's um, <laughs> it's like aliens are coming in, but um, 
but like something that could be probable that your team can red team in advance to prepare for a response that is um, thought about in advance so that you're not trying to think on the on, in the immediate fly and then getting things wrong or misrepresenting um, uh, groups of people um, or or um, or a political party. I think the other thing that we're encouraging local newsrooms to do is Google um, how do I vote in your area and see what comes up. Is, that, is there good information there? If there's not good information, backfill it with good, good old fashioned service journalism pieces. I know uh, journalists hate to write them, but they're so critical. Um, the day after the first Brexit vote, the most Googled term in the UK was, what is the European Union? And I think how many journalists would, would have loved to have known that in advance to be like, oh my God, there's like, this is why people are voting against it because they don't even know what they're voting for. So um, where are those deficits locally for you? Um, who has good information out? Can you, can you rise that information up, write more service pieces? Um, anytime there is a disruption or a change of how people vote, whether it's now there's a voter ID law or now there's two signatures required um, is a disruption and it's really hard to communicate. And we saw that with uh, coronavirus um, information where at the beginning um, the CDC said, save all of the masks for uh, first responders. We have a shortage of masks. Um, and so masks weren't really needed. And then they tried to shift to get everybody to wear masks. And now there's confusion, uh, which is, um, allowed misinformation actors to, and disinformation actors to swoop in and be like, they're not consistent. They're telling us one thing, what will it be next month? And suddenly it's a civil liberties crisis rather than um, a health crisis. Um, so we really want to have clear messaging and make sure that, uh, especially in your area, that, that the people have information that is clear, succinct, tells them exactly what to do and what to expect on um, election days and weeks. Great, thank you. So I've seen a lot of that, you know, how do you mail, do you drop off a ballot, do you mail a ballot, or, you know, back and forth. So what do you guys suggest um, journalists do when they see misinformation circulating on, you know, in their community, in their groups, on Twitter? Do we attack it head on? Do we reply to it? I've heard don't um, retweet with corrections because it amplifies it. So what are your methods of battling it when you see it out in your communities? I have often asked journalists to um, to take five minutes, maybe even three minutes a day, find something that's wrong on Twitter and respond to it with a, a link to uh, correct information. I think if if everyone would do that, we would um, we would see maybe I, misinformation is always going to outnumber the the correct information on twitter and social media but i think we could at least make a dent in it if everybody tried to do that so i think especially if you're a beat reporter you don't ignore that if somebody is you're seeing somebody in your feed who's constantly um you know delivering false information to people you respond to it and, and you're right you don't repeat the misinformation but a link to uh, to the correct information or just a couple of facts right there is, I think, the, the most direct way to fight it. And I would highly recommend that people take time in their day to do that. It's hard to not be finger waggy with it. Um, like, that's the wrong information. So it's... Um, part of me wants to investigate that a little. That's what First Draft does. And to ask, where, where did you get that? And what makes you think that way? And, and how did you get that information? Um, to maybe try and find the source of um, the viral tweet or the viral, um, the viral meme. Um, and sometimes these things jump platforms. And that's when we know that it has um, mass recognition or at least mass circulation. Um, and, it, and in some ways, if, especially if it's a meme where they have that kernel of truth, but then there's this whole other element to it that is like dark and ugly or preys upon the worst instincts of humanity, uh, there might be reporting opportunities in there. It, the meme might be indicating in, income insecurity. And you know, has your newsroom covered that closely enough? Has it addressed it locally? Has it addressed how the national, um, the, the, the na what the implications are locally because of national decisions or indecisions? Um, and just to, you know, uh, to add on that, to, to, 
sort of be careful with you, you know your own social media activity, right? Um, uh, when you're a reporter in a, your community, a beat reporter, um, people really look to you as a source of information. Um, and you know, um, I, I think you know this day and age, sort of trusted sources are very important. Um, so you know, uh, sort of do what you would expect other uh, you know good actors on social media to be doing. Uh, you know, don't don't retweet without reading without you know knowing that um, it's true I, I think you know Twitter can can be sort of a quick way of you know doing um, you know maybe a, a quick you know piece of journalistic content that isn't a story right um, and so you should think of it sort of the same way great thank you and that actually leads into our next question how can journalists make sure they're not a vehicle for the spread of misinformation um, like Jeff said, occasionally, you know, they retweet something they think is true or they don't click through to the link. What advice do you guys have for journalists just to make sure that they're not accidentally spreading misinformation? I, I think one thing in our newsroom that we and then many newsrooms have maybe overlooked is um, uh, visuals. So I, I think we all are um, as aware as we can be most of the time of not retweeting bad information and not um, repeating it, not putting it in our stories, but sometimes we forget about the visuals. So we had a couple of situations where we covered rallies and marches and protests and people were carrying signs, which, you know, typical um, rally photo where you have tons of people with tons of signs and there was there were so many signs with so much misinformation in there. We weren't really thinking about that. And so choose another photo, you know, choose another photo. You don't want to doctor a photo, but you want to choose another photo that doesn't, you know, have this huge in your face um, message that is completely incorrect. And and also with with headlines, I mean, we there's a way to write a good fact check headline in our newsroom. We find that if we if we start the headline with the words fact check colon and and then say something after that that does not repeat the misinformation not only does that get us more page views people people love to see this the word fact check in front of the headline um, it it really helps us um, set the stage for what people are going to read and um, you know this this is what you're going to get here and it sets it apart from every other story so those are those are two things and this, this is one thing that's going to take some advanced work, but you have to get people to trust you first before they will even trust your fact checks or anything else that you, you write, but especially fact checks because people are always willing to tear into your, your fact checking um, methodology. So if you have an ethics policy in your newsroom, always put that with your fact checks. Ours is like permanently attached to, to our fact checks. Um, if you have a corrections policy, just a general corrections policy that, that you use in your newsroom, make sure people know about that too. So just kind of set the stage for we are credible, we are working hard to bring you good information, and we've done this for a long time, and you know, you can trust our fact check. So establishing that trust ahead of time is really important. Great, thank you. Amy, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it comes down to sourcing as always in journalism. And the problem is when some of these activities are online, not every journalist is trained on how to source for things online. Um, so, you know, there is digital footprinting that you can do. We do training on that. All of those, uh, all of those courses are free. Um, and uh, we give we give webinars on that a lot too. But, um, you know, I think we saw this a lot with the Save the Children rallies this past Saturday. Um, there were probably between two and 220 um, rallies that took place in, in towns across the US. And on its face, it sounds like a really nice rally, Save the Children. Who doesn't want to save the children? But there is a slice of that um, that is being driven by QAnon uh, supporters or people in the QAnon community. And it's really, important for um, journalists to know that context so they're not just saying hey come down on Saturday you know everybody wants to save the children it's like you're also allowing a conspiracy community to uh, sort of 
of get new people who aren't acquainted with all of their rhetoric uh, into that. So um, I think we, we saw a lot of, uh, in particular, um, local TV stations uh, uh, not promoting the rally, but certainly listing it on their website as an event in the community. Um, and to just be very um, aware that um, if something sounds really great, like to talk to like child sex, sex trafficking experts in your community or people who are working uh, to stop that and on a nonprofit level to see are they participating in it. And what was very confusing about these events is that yes, some of those um, nonprofits were participating or in some cases leading that, but there was a contingency of uh, QAnon uh, community members who, who really wanted to spread uh, other messages about a deep state and, um, and baby eating Democrats. So, you know, I mean, that's really kind of uh, part of their belief system or ideology. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's just important to, um, to know who's promoting events, know who is trying to get the messages out. Uh, we also saw similar things about accusing the 17 year old shooter in Kenosha of being a militia member. He wasn't. So, um, you know, how do you verify that in the digital age and do it in a very quick time because the public doesn't have a tolerance. And, and, I, and I worry about this election cycle. There's no tolerance for we don't know yet. We just don't know. We're trying to find out. We're not sure um, when, you know, we won't probably have um, results to the national elections until, um, you know, weeks after the election happens. Um, so how are we going to satisfy that horse race that journalists love um, and the public's desire to know? And when they don't know, there is a real push to fill in uh, with your own narratives about why well, I think this is probably what's happening. There's a deep state at work who's not allowing boats to go through and it goes on and on and on. So that's my four cents. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 I think it's, it's tough too, you know, when you're working on a story, um, you know, like uh, often, you, you know, the reporter doesn't directly observe the thing that, you know, was claimed to to have happened, right? You, you sort of, you know, gain knowledge from, you know, your reporting, from interviewing people, from trying to reconstruct the events. Um, and, you know, I, I think at ProPublic it's a little bit easier because we have the luxury of time to sort of, you know, show our work and say, how do we, like, this is what we know, this is how we know it, this is what we don't know. Um, and, you know, I, to be honest, it's, it's kind of tough to sort of balance that with, you know, if you're in sort of a more fast uh, environment. Um, but, uh, I think in the course of showing your work, um, that'll sort of help you sharpen your reporting as well. Um, you know, write about how you know something. Don't try to, you know, hang statements on people without, you know, verifying uh, the truth behind it. Great, thank you. So how should newsrooms or journalists deal with if they see their content being used um, to spread misinformation? I've seen, you know, photos taken in Photoshop, quotes taken out of context. You guys have methods uh, that could be helpful to journalists who might have to deal with that this season. Yeah, I, I can talk about what we do in, in our newsroom and it's, it's no different than anything else, any other time when somebody uses our content in an unauthorized way, we um, contact them directly if we can and ask them to, to take it down or um, modify it or whatever it needs to be done. And if they don't respond and they, or they say no, then we call their lawyer. So that's, that's basically our process. I, I think the trickier thing is finding all the places that they are misusing our content. And that, that is tough. Um, I would say about half the time we went across it our, on our own and about half the time somebody will call us and say, hey, did you know so-and-so um, was, was using your photo in, in this way, which is, which is great that they do that, but it is really tough to, to track those down. I, I don't have a lot of experience with sort of like, you know, calling, calling the lawyers, <laughs> but uh, um, I do use some tools to track uh, sort of what's been done with um, the work that I put out there. Um, something like Google Alerts is helpful. Um, crowd tangle is quite good. You can, you know, put have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, browser uh, plugin where you could um, sort of see, you know, if your story is trending anywhere and sort of look at sort of what people are saying about it. Um, for images, something like reverse image search, you know, where where uh, your images show up. Um, so, you know, uh, technology can sort of help uh, 
figure out <laughs> where your content is going online. Yeah, what, what we see a lot of um, is uh, logo squatting. So logos have immediate recognition with people. It's a great heuristic Like people are like, oh, I trust. Uh, this news organization. We saw it, um, we've seen it twice now with the Detroit Free Press. Uh, one instance was uh, they, there was an anti-Latinx community uh, message um, that was being shared saying the Detroit Free Press believes this or endorses this and then has a story about this. And, you know, they, they spent um, a, a couple of weeks like hunting down the source for this and and trying to do some kind of, in some ways it's like brand uh, protection um, and to to try and rewrite the record the problem is once that stuff is out there it's out there uh, we've also seen um, uh, Twitter accounts uh, be screen shotted and replaced with other text from journalists uh, or reported to be about journalists that happened in the wake of the Parkland shooting uh, with a Miami Herald reporter and they, uh, you know, somebody was claiming that, that she was asking for the racial identity and for photos of the dead and she just, she's like, I, that wasn't me. It's really hard to correct that and to get people to think that she wasn't up to no good with that because it fits with the, the mainstream narrative, um, the mainstream media narrative is, you know, that they're, that they're, um, that they're bloodthirsty and and don't care about other people's feelings or getting the truth of the story. So, um, you know, you have to be really vigilant. I think Jeff, you know, mentions crowd tangle. There's also like, um, that you can see where some of your um, articles are, are landing um, and to, you know, be really good stewards of the brand that you work for, but also uh, your own identity if you're on Twitter and happen to have a, a, a presence um, because, uh, people will use it to their own means. There was, um, you know, the, the South Bend Tribune, ho uh, the home paper of uh, uh, Pete Buttigieg um, had a doctored uh, front page from the 1990s claiming that Pete Buttigieg was arrested for choking dogs. They had to go ahead and do a whole um, briefing on this to try and protect their brand. And one of the things they did was not show uh, the doctored image, but showed this was our page on that day. This was our front page on that day. And so that's a great way to show and not tell. Like, we're, we're not hiding anything. This is exactly how the front page ran in 1996. So um, there's a lot of things that can be done, but oftentimes some of the damage just you just can't cover from. For sure. And then um, I have been talking to some editors lately and they are, some of them are leaning more towards just deleting misinformation or disinformation off of their pages if they have readers or people who are spreading it on their home pages. Um, what do you guys think about social media policies addressing this? Do you think that works better than just contradicting it with the truth? Like what would your methods be to battle this within their own channels? Um, so we, we had a comment section and we decided to get rid of it. Um, so I think, I think it's, it, you know, it, it, nothing, nothing useful ever comes from it except for more engagement, I guess. Um, so, you know, um, I, and, you know, in terms of, uh, deleting comments and and sort of maybe um, you know deleting versus putting sort of like a, a note correcting a false comment underneath it um, I, I think both are good uh, good ways but I mean you know I, I don't think comments at the end of the day are that valuable uh, at the bottom of a, <laughs> a, a news article a comment section so our, our comments show up on our Facebook pages now and for the, you know, for the reason that we, that, you know, Jeff just said that it's just, you know, they're not valuable and it is a lot of work to monitor those. But then on the other hand, we find ourselves monitoring the Facebook comments as well. And it really is like whack-a-mole. I mean, no, no one, at least I don't have the staff to, to do that um, 24 hours a day. And so it's really what rises to the, the top. And we, we do sometimes delete comments, um, but we try to to respond to the comments first. If it's something that is not, you know, it's not too egregious, we respond to it, provide a link to our own content uh, for the correct information, and um, and then monitor the comments after that. Because the last thing we want to do is to get into a back and forth. We don't have time for that either, and that that's the problem with responding to a comment 
in social media and Twitter and everything else, I mean, you, you just immediately open yourselves up for hours or days of a back and forth with the person who started it. So it's just, it's a tricky balancing act. And, you know, we look for the people who have the biggest followings, uh, who might be more influential with, with a number of people and kind of focus on that. Yeah, I like the comment section. So I'm not a daily journalist. So Jeff, as a daily journalist, I can see why you wouldn't want comments on the bottom of your articles. Uh, that makes total sense. But I think it's a great way to, there, of course, there's vitriol, there's spam, there's all kinds of problematic posters on there. But I do think it's a way to get community members who are not represented in your newsroom to be able to cast their ideas and their additions to that reporting uh, to relay their experience. And I think it could be a rich uh, territory for, oh, I hadn't thought, you know, as, as the beat reporter for City Hall, I hadn't thought about that aspect before. Maybe there's a story there. So I, I do think, um, you know, there's a lot of slush that you will have to wade through. But I, I do think if you are a steady reader of comments, you can quickly scan and see um, uh, what might be useful and what is just more noise. Um, and I think sometimes too, readers just want to be heard. Um, and so even if it's like, you guys suck, you're lamestream media, it's like, they you know, they walk away and they're like, okay, good, I've done my job. Um, which, you know, that's annoying. Again, it's not, it's not, not uh, love and light. It's a bunch of negative steam and it says more about them than the paper. Um, but I don't know. I think, you know, for us, when we do our work, uh, when we're looking for the best of the worst online, uh, we dig into the comments on Facebook in particular to see what is the language that they're using. Um, we find our keywords, which surface more of the same kind of junk, um, which is really useful. Um, we didn't know about uh, excessive, the, the phrase excessive quarantine until we uh, dug into a, a Michigan uh, militia group. Um, that was using the phrase excessive quarantine and then all of a sudden all of these reopen groups came up. So that was really useful. We can also see who the influencers are uh, through social media um, uh, comments. Um, and that can also be helpful because it's like, oh, this person has an audience of 10, uh, you know, 10,000 in a small community and they're posting their comments here. They are influencers and it, you know, I want to hear at least what they're saying. I might not report on it, but I want to hear what they're interested in, what their take is, and um, to maybe get ahead of this conversation instead of always being on the back foot. Great. Thank you. So... Let's now go to, do you have any favorite tools, um, specific methods, technology? Is there anything out there that's helping you guys with these issues right now? Uh, what would you suggest journalists and newsrooms take a look at to help them deal with this? Uh, I, I'll defer on this one because I actually, you know, our pieces sort of take a little bit longer to uh, put together and they're much more targeted and specific so um it's, i sort of don't do a lot of thinking about that sort of stuff if other folks can weigh in uh, yeah we have online courses uh some of them take um an hour some of them can take five weeks if you if you want it to take five weeks. It just depends on how uh, motivated you can stay with online learning. We also have uh, an SMS course. And so for if you sign up, you get 14 days of one SMS message a day that gives you just primers on the very basics of verification with links to learn more if you want to. Um, but you know, I we love uh, looking at, the, there was a, a photo that circulated a couple weeks ago, oh, no, last week, sorry, in, during COVID, Everything feels like months ago, and it was just last week. But um, there was a photo that circulated from Wisconsin showing a piling of mailboxes uh, on a junkyard. And it was like, see, you know, they're taking away our mailboxes. Well, if you do um, a Google, um, if you do a Google, Google Maps and you look at the street view from a year ago, you see the same piling of of mailboxes. So when we called this place where these piling mailboxes is, their their service is to um, is to repair mailboxes and to repaint them. And so of course there's a piling. There's always a piling. It's not some conspiracy theory uh, from the right or the left. And so I love um, when something like Street View can really uh, get you. Um, some evidence to, to make that phone call so that you can make your next phone call. Um, and so with, um, 
with everything with online um, and, and just basic reporting is that you come closer to the truth with every phone call, every search you do, and you might not ever know the exact right thing, but you have enough to report on uh, with confidence that uh, this piling of mailboxes is not a deep-seated uh, conspiracy theory. It happens to be um, just uh, a company that services lots and lots of mailboxes at a really um, difficult time. <laughs> Great. Uh, Jane, did you want to add some tools and resources? Yeah, I mean, the tools that have been mentioned, like Crown Tangle and the reverse image searches, but there, Pointer does have uh, at least one or two free fact checking courses um, mm -hmm. that are, I think, an hour long. And they, there are a list of resources and tools and technology that you can use in there. Um, I know I co authored one with Alexios Mansarlis, who used to be with um, Pointer. And there are a lot of scenarios, like what would you do in this situation? How would you verify the story or uh, this photo? So it's, it's kind of a fun course and um, it's, I think it's well worth an hour, but definitely take advantage of those. Great, thank you. So uh, now we can go to attendee questions. If any of you have questions, please type them in the chat box or the Q&A, um, or you can raise your hand at this point. There's a little raise your hand button and I can allow you uh, to ask your questions. Uh, let's see, okay. So the first question is, um, is different disinformation also when someone doesn't intentionally reveal some information or is it only when they intentionally reveal wrong information? Russian style. <laughs> the sin of omission is a very, well, sorry, I've got Russians in my life. So they're like, I didn't lie to you. I just didn't tell you. It's like, well, that is the same difference. But um, uh, it can be, it can be, it can be. Uh, it's just, it's perverting the, uh, the, the, the um, information around a story to tell another story, you know, and, and with purpose to fool. Um, others. And I think that it's that intention behind it that is a real driver. And so as Jeff mentioned earlier, uh, that it, there's an emotional component to it because emotions, you know, tend to drive shares and anger. Um, and uh, when we look for things on CrowdTango, we're almost always sorting through the angry uh, emoji to, to see what's um, to see what's really ticking people off that day, because that is uh, one of the biggest in indicators of virality. All right. Uh, Lou, I think I'm going to allow you to talk. Oh, it says you are using an older version of Zoom and I can't let you. Can you type your question? Um, oh. oh, here we go. How do you respond to family, friends, or people who are so overwhelmed by misinformation that they have just stopped consuming the news? Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, trusted sources are very important uh, of, of news. Um, you know, it, I think one of the sort of uh, problems of social media is, you know, um, all the different sources of information on the internet that they're sort of like, collected and presented with the same uh, type of, uh, you know, formatting, production value. And it's quite hard, uh, you know, even for experienced journalists to figure out, you know, uh, which story is true and which story is false, right? And, and no one really has the time to um, sort of, you know, in detail fact check each piece of information that they see on the internet. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, you, you sort of have to, you know, vet, uh, you know, the few few sources of information that you trust and go with them. Uh, and, you know, uh, I think, you know, in traditional news media, right, like, you're, you know, these organizations' reputations are at stake, right? They've been doing it for a long time. Um, and I think that's, that's you know, <laughs> if they're willing to, to, you know, read mainstream media, I think that's what they should go with. Uh, um, because there's a lot of other stuff out there. My my trick has been to get a digital description uh, subscription to <laughs> my friends and family who make who make that comment. It's true. It does happen all the time. It's like I can't read anything anymore. It just drives me crazy. It's too upsetting. You know, it's too emotional. Um, 
And it, but, but really, if you can just minimize the number of sources that you're looking at, it does become less overwhelming. So of course, I recommend my own um, news organization. And you know, most of us in, in local news organizations have some kind of friends and family subscription um, that you can offer to people. And it's, um, I, I think it's a good way to get people to, to really focus on one news source and the trusted news source and not be so overwhelmed and have them try it for two months and, and see what yeah. happens. And I, I think when you sort of explain, you know, I mean, if you have the time, uh, if they have the time, uh, explain sort of like how, how the media industry works, right? Like people always say, you know, the media, right? But that, there's no the media, you know, it's um, a lot of different organizations with different standards, publishing different things. Um, different ways of, of betting what they know. So, um, and different business models, right? You know, some are very much engagement driven, right? Um, so I think when they sort of think about, you know, um, sort of how the information gets to them and, 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 you know, why different organizations act the way they do, it's easier to sort of convince them that, you know, some organizations are more worth following than others. And as long as there's not like a shaming component, like how could you, how dare you share that? <clears throat> I think, again, again, a more open-ended question is what made you believe that or how did you find that? And that's really interesting, but um, have you considered this or that? Um, my family has a WhatsApp group and um, that is might be a nice way for your family to share and relate around um, uh, topics of interest or topics that are of interest to you. Um, you know, uh, when I think about um, topics that affect your family directly, it might be healthcare um, or, or something like that to say, you know, this issue is really important for me and this particular candidate supports something um, that, that I do in terms of like, if you're narrowing down like why you're supporting a party or a candidate or, or a topic um, to explain why and how it's important to you um, to, to bring it back to the personal rather than this big old, it's the Democrats or it's the Republicans and everybody's this way and nobody's never that way. And you know, the, all of these um, emphatic statements that, that um, just really serve to um, drive up um, antagonism and confusion. Thank you. So next question is from Christine. So with emotional triggers as a driving force for virality, how can civil discourse be encouraged or reinforced? How do you get people to talk to each other nicely? Um, I know there's a lot of ugliness out there. So kind of how do you guys handle that? Do you encourage people to speak to each other a certain way? Um, is there a way to be enforced that? I don't know that there is. I mean, it's the, it's, it's the platforms, it's how they make their money, it's how they keep people on the platform is to, um, not with intention, but it happens to radicalize people um, and to pull people apart. So get offline is my biggest recommendation. <laughs> biggest recommendation is like, it's not a place where ideas are intended to be shared and exchanged and listened to and supported or, or sparred with. It's a, it's, a, it's a stage to take down, to tear down, to eliminate uh, the opponent. You know, it's a winner take all situation and it's not a place often. I mean, I, mean, I would welcome the Reddit thread that, you know, engages in civil discourse. Um, I'm sure they're out there. Um, and if you know of them, please drop them in the chat. But, um, <laughs> but right now, uh, if we're talking about mainstream platforms, Twitter and Facebook in particular, it's about um, canceling and uh, eliminating uh, your opponent rather than, um, really exchanging uh, rich ideas um, that might be in conflict, but can, but, but can be okay within that conflict. Um, an additional thing to keep in mind for sort of like online, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of messaging wars and things like that is, you know, it, it may often be the case too that, uh, you know, many of the actors don't really believe what they're putting out there, right? Um, studies have found that, you know, once uh, sort of, you know, a topic tends to go viral, um, you know, uh, people will try to just, you know, ride that wave and get attention for whatever their own, um, you know, uh, objectives are, you know, through uh, making um, sort of controversial statements and uh, on that topic, right? Um, and a lot of these interests are often commercial or, you know, not 
you know, for reporting, you know, good information. So it, it, there's just a lot that they have. Get offline, right? It's designed to, um, you know, uh, engage you mindlessly. <laughs> And I would, I have to add to that too. I just don't think civil discourse is possible on, on those platforms. And if it is for five minutes, it's not sustainable. So I, I think that in small ways we can all do, do things to bring people together in person. Well, not really in person right now, but at least um, face to face and having, having chats and we, um, we can set up reader panels. We can do Facebook live just so people can actually have a discussion. And, and that's where you can have a discussion of, about, okay, what do we agree on? Let's start with what we agree on and then kind of go from there. Because in almost every controversial situation or topic or issue or political issue, there is something you can find that most people will agree on. And that is a hard message to get across when you're doing it on Twitter or Facebook when you have all these other voices coming in at the same time and you can't um, you can't really have a conversation so i definitely agree with that all right uh next question um with how many people form opinions from first impressions what tips do you have in trying to deprogram some of these unhealthy opinions or i would say change um among people who might not usually be willing to look at new information or contradictory information I, I feel like I needed to go need to go to some other school besides journalism school to answer that question. <laughs> yeah. It, we, you know, that it is, it's a lot to expect of, of journalists um, to, to handle those types of situations. And I think you can only do it on an individual basis um, when, when you are having in-person conversations and again, trying to find what people can, can agree on and, um, and also just putting yourself out there as a journalist and a real person and a person who lives in the community and, um, and making sure that the people know that, that you're real and not evil. Um, but, but that, that really, I understand that's a drop in the bucket, a very large bucket. So as far as, um, so I know, you know, COVID is making everything harder, but a lot of this does come back to your community trusting you, um, as was mentioned earlier. Do you guys have any advice for journalists who want to increase that trust and connection with their community? So when they do, you know, correct information or provide information, their communities really actually do believe them and take their word. Um, is there anything you do in your newsrooms regularly to connect with your communities and let them know that you're trustworthy? Um, I don't know if we have any specific programs. I, I think, I mean, we hope that we can like let our work speak for itself, but I guess maybe, uh, maybe we just haven't given it enough thought to be honest. Um, again, like, you know, it's hard, it's hard enough, you know, doing stories. Right. Um, and it's, uh, it's, um, it definitely feels like, uh, you know, sort of a bigger, bigger issue than, um, you know, we can take on. And, uh, so it's, it's, yeah. You know, I think for, for us, it's like transparency of the work. So it's like, I, you know, it's not just that we can verify this image. How did we verify the image? What tool did we use? And of our five steps of verification, what of those things do we know? Do we know who took it? Do we know when and, and why they took it? Do we know um, where they took it? Like, were they really at that scene or are they, is it from a different protest? I'm thinking we're doing a lot of protest stuff right now. So uh, was it from a different protest? And if you can tell your audience, we did a reverse image search using, sorry, uh, using Revi reverse image search. Um, and this is the, this is what we got back that it's, you know, this is a photo that's circulated since 2012. We don't know who took it, but we're looking into that. I think if you can tell your audience is what you do know, how you came to those conclusions and also what you don't know. And in some ways not to crowdsource it, but it's like, if anybody has a lead on who might've taken this photo, I mean, that can be a great way to engage an audience or at least show that we don't have all the answers, but we are looking for those answers. Great, thank you, Jane. Did you want to add anything? 
Yeah, we talked a little about uh, taking down comments and a lot of local newsrooms have, have done that, but you don't want to do that without replacing it with something else. And we have, have tried, I mean, we use Facebook, obviously, and we do try to respond on Twitter, but our reporters are also very accessible too. There are all kinds of ways to reach them and, and most of them are extremely responsive. And I, I, that's, again, a small thing and it's individual, but I think that um, once you keep doing that and you, you're responding to people who are influential and, and then tell uh, their friends that, you know, I heard this personally from a reporter um, at the News and Observer, those, those things are incremental, but they, they add up and they, um, they add up to trust. And I, I think that um, even though we don't like comments anymore, we need to make sure that we do replace that with a way to communicate with people and a two-way communication, not just one way. Great, thank you. So a question from Sherry. Um, they say, could you please address the technique source hacking, an indirect way of targeting journalists by planting false information in places they know they will encounter it? Um, have you guys encountered this and how, I guess, how would you address it? Um. I, I mean, uh, sometimes I get definitely get sort of, you know, leaks from people. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, more, more senior colleagues, he, you know, he, he says, you know, he'll take a tip from the devil himself, right, if it's true. Um, so, you know, I think if, it, if it's true, it's true, right? And it's our responsibility to, you know, report the facts uh, properly contextualized. Um, so I think it's, you know, I think the more targeted something is, uh, the more suspicious I am of ulterior motives. Uh, but definitely, you know, you sort of treat it as your as part of the natural course of uh, checking out what you report on. Um, I just dropped a link in uh, from Joan Donovan and Brian Friedberg from Data and Society. Um, they did a whole report on source hacking, and it's. It's excellent, uh, but part of the source hacking can be um, manipulation around has hashtags, uh, doing leading hashtag brigades, making something go viral that uh, shouldn't save our children is an example of that. Uh, um, that they kind of took that uh, language over from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and usurped it for their own purposes. Um, and again, if if a journalist isn't digital footprinting, isn't going and finding the direct source of that stuff, that is how things um, can easily get fooled. Um, journalists who are inexperienced with 4chan dip into 4chan and think that they've found the next big thing. And meanwhile, there's a parallel conversation happening on 4chan of like, I have, I've got this guy. You know, I've, I'm ready to fool them. And as soon as you start reporting on it, they are howling at it. You know, they think it's hilarious. They most famously did it when they said that, um, I think uh, the Anti-Defamation League was into 4chan, it was in 4chan asking, um, uh, talking about the Parkland shooter. And they said, oh yeah, he's part of a neo-Nazi group. And so they went with it. Um, and the Parkland shooter was not part of a neo-Nazi group. So, you know, the ADL went with it, ABC News, went with it and after that it was like well abc news is reporting that blood you know dot 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 so um it doesn't take much for something like that to happen but i do think inexperience in spaces um is where a lot of that kind of stuff happens and and thinking that something is trending on twitter uh legitimately and not looking into has it been um hacked in any way um either through bot activity or um or um, group amplification. The anti-vaccination community is deeply motivated to um, sway public opinion. Um, and you know they, they have had some outcomes from that. So I think uh, you wanna look at those uh, either bot or um, actual uh, motivated groups um, to uh, coordinate messaging. I, I would say everything that you just said is like super complicated. <laughs> and if you said that to one of our brand new reporters walking in the door after graduating, I mean, and, and I shouldn't just say it's young people. They, those of us who went to journalism school a long time ago, we never talked about this stuff. I mean, there was very little about misinformation, if anything, and verification. And, um, and really only if you go to a good journalism school are you getting that right now. Uh, and I, I can see that from the job applicants that, that we get, um, that 
you know, they're just not prepared. And I've, I've said before that I would rather give uh, applicants, job applicants, a test for how they deal with misinformation or if they can identify misinformation than a writing test. It's, it's just way more important to me right now. So we do have to look at the training aspect of this and it's, it's the responsibility of the managers in the newsroom to make sure that their staffs have that information, they have that training and they keep having it because as you know, it changes all the time. And so uh, one last question um, from a student, it looks like, what advice would you give to student journalists heading into this election, election season? What will be unique compared to past years that they can learn from? Yeah, um, I think uh, definitely be open-minded, <laughs> even though, you know, we're trying to, um, uh, you know, combat disinformation, misinformation, but everyone is always sort of discussing what happened last time, right? Um, so, you know, I think your skepticism shouldn't just be based on pattern matching of what happened in 2016 or beforehand. Um, this year it might be different, right? Um, so be, be open-minded with your skepticism, I guess. I think um, it, there's a lot of confusion around how and where students vote. Are students registered it, at their school, you know, to vote in their in the school district, or are they um, registered at their home in their home community, um, <clears throat> and are they eligible to vote um, in in that area? So I think if you can do some <clears throat> primers on that to help students uh, navigate uh, what their rights are and and how they um, can exercise those rights to vote uh, or the right to vote, that would be excellent. Um, and the other thing is I would take a look at um, the election in 2000. Uh, that is an election that wasn't called uh, the night of. It took about, I think, was it 36 days after, after the election date? Um, I think there's real lessons in there, certainly one of patience and one of not walking away with, we've got a winner because that um, I, those days might be over entirely because society is so polarized and, and it kind of comes down to like a 50-50 split. So it's always going to be, you know, a margin of error on either side. So I think, um, I think Jeff mentioned patience. I would say patience too, but to refer back to know, know what happened in the election of 2000 and, and how that went down within newsrooms um, and how you might fortify your newsroom uh, to, through, through the lens of the 2000 election. And can I just suggest one quick thing, and is that that is to try to make it fun, especially for students. Um, you know, you can get any number of YouTube videos that are, are uh, political advertisements on YouTube and dissect those every minute, every second, every photo, every word, and, and really talk about what those messages are and what they're trying to say with the way they present images and, and phrases. And um, it's it actually is a, a fun thing to do and it can lead to a very good conversation. Great, thank you so much. So we're at our hour. Thank you, all three of you for giving us your knowledge and advice. And for everyone attending, I will be emailing out a tip sheet. We'll be including it with the recording and that will also have contact information for everyone that you heard speaking here today in case you have questions that you would like to ask them personally or, um, you know, in the future that you didn't think of today. So thank you again, everyone, and have a great weekend.